Oh, thank you. Thank you all for um, being here today. This is uh, the fifth uh, regional webinar of the series of this International Geomorphology Week. Uh, during the night, actually the U European night, uh, we had uh, the webinar from Southeast Asia and Oceania, and it was a very successful one. I'm sure this one will be the same. And I thank uh, the coordinators of this event, uh, including our Vice President uh, Francisco Gutierrez for having uh, uh, managed, uh, organized and managed uh, the webinar, which seems very promising in terms of um, topics uh, that will be uh, presented and discussed. And um, thanks uh, to the speakers as well for uh, having accepted uh, the invitation. And um, I would like just to let you know that the week will go on and uh, at, at the end of this meeting, another one will start and it will be the one uh, dealt, uh, organized by the colleagues from uh, uh, Central and uh, uh, Southern America. It will be starting at 1 p.m. Central European time. And uh, we will go on for the whole week. And actually, we will have an appendix uh, next week on the 8th of March uh, when um, uh, the second workshop uh, uh, dedicated to women in geomorphology will be held, organized by uh, the, the Greek colleagues of um, uh, the Hellenic Society for Geomorphology. So um, uh, I wish you uh, a pleasant uh, a pleasant uh, uh, webinar and uh, uh, please uh, continue to to attend uh, the International Geomorphology Week events. I will uh, copy into the chat uh, the program and uh, the link for registration so in case someone has not registered for the next events uh, can easily do it. Thank you very much Irene and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much Mauro for being here with us. Thank you. Um, so today will be a very interesting webinar. Uh, the speakers are geomorphologists uh, uh, from uh, Italy, Malta, Portugal, Spain, and they will present a very diversified range of topics touching different uh, morphogenic and morphoclimatic contexts. We will pass uh, through cost evolution, including liquefaction features as well as indicators of earthquakes along coast, climate control on landslides, from cast controlling factor to soil and mountain environments as archive of past geomorphological processes. We also uh, see example of uh, analysis on the relation with human settlements in a very iconic Mediterranean site, as well as the importance of estimation of sediment budget in erosion at spot area. I'm very happy to be moderator in uh, such interesting international session. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to the IAG webinar. Um, I hope I'll be on time, so just let me know in case I go too much over. Uh, so this uh, presentation that I'm doing today uh, covers um, several years of research from my PhD to my current uh, research project at the University of Malta. So um, several things are still ongoing and I'm open to give you further details of the current work or of the past work uh, afterwards and um, pointing out a few things. Uh, so these are the contents of my presentation. Uh, I will briefly explain what is liquefaction and why do we care about liquefiable sediments, um, why, what is the empirical use and what are the methodologies that geologists or geomorphologists use to investigate these features. Then I will explain two cases uh, two case studies uh, in terms of applications, and I will shift from the onshore uh, field towards the offshore. And then I will conclude with some general remarks and references in case somebody is interested in something uh, afterwards. 
So let's start explaining what are uh, liquefiable sediments. So usually liquefiable sediments are fairly recent sediments of late Pleistocene or Holocene in age, and uh, that could be found in coastal plain or alluvial plain, and are characterized by silty or sandy sediments that um, since they are unconsolidated, so they didn't go through the diagenetic processes and are in undrained conditions, so high water table, when there is a seismic loading line, which means an earthquake, um, this sediment change uh, their physical state. And this is particularly obvious also when we see the thin sections, for example, not only in the stratigraphic profile. And what happens? So during a uh, seismic loading, there is a sudden increase of full water pressure that causes the sediment and uh, so the water and the eluterated sediment to travel upwards during uh, the process and to redeposit at the surface. So on the left uh, hand side of this slide, we see how um, the physical properties um, modify the original arrangement of the cranes and we see uh, an empathetic course of stress and strain and how the peak of stress once uh, there is an, uh, when there is an application of several cycles, the peak of stress is reached and then there is a way, the ultimate strength, when the sediment again is redeposited at the surface and the, um, each grain can uh, connect to the other, to, to the other ones uh, again. So in this change of physical properties during the liquefaction process, so we, have, we also have a deep change of the stratigraphic profile that we will see in this diagram on the right hand side of the slide. So um, when we go and open trenches, because that's the way our liquefaction features could be studied, um, we see that there is the, uh, the occurrence of dikes and uh, cutting dikes that um, show how the sediment has been concentrated in particular fractured zones and has been redeposited then in the, uh, at the surface in the, in the, um, in the shape of semblows or um, coalescent semblows. Uh, these features are actually the features that we see at the surface and that when they get preserved, so in specific geomorphic sections um, and settings could be particularly useful for uh, investigating further how these uh, deposits are formed, how the process occurs, and um, in terms, and then these features are specifically used in terms of paleoseismic uh, purposes. So um, this is uh, the need why the aim of uh, this type of research and more in general of this type of investigation, geomorphic investigation of liquefaction features uh, that has been Mm, that has sta started in the mid 60s uh, uh, during uh, as a consequence of the major earthquakes of the Alaska and Japan earthquakes that happened both in 1964 and then was further um, carried uh, over the, these last decades. Um, so, uh, paleoseismologists, geologists, and then in particular, paleoseismologists, so people who will study ancient earthquakes. Um, found that uh, the occurrence of liquefaction features at the surface was particularly important and particularly accurate to date um, evidence of past earthquakes. And so uh, by understanding the evidence of past earthquakes, we could uh, improve the earthquake, the earthquake as an analysis of a specific area and thus the resilience of that population. So here I have listed this sort of simple flow chart on uh, how this geomorphic evidence of liquefaction features is useful for a longer uh, research uh, aim and what paleoseismicity has been meaning throughout the year. Um, in order to investigate these features, uh, not only the, surf the surficial geology is important, but we need to detail and we need to understand better also the sedimentology 
So um, uh, this work uh, entails uh, a whole lot of methodologies that um, span from the terrestrial geology and the marine geology as well. And so in case we are onshore, of course, we use the, the LIDAR. And in case we are offshore, we need to use the bathymetric analysis in order to have a traffic investigation. And then, of course, uh, onshore, we could have more detail by investigating the stratigraphy at a broader scale, at a coarser scale, so investigating the paleoseismic trenches, and then um, more detailed analysis with the piston cores, and then, of course, dating the sampling and analyzing the arrangement of the sedimentology with thin sections and grain size analysis. Um, the geophysics also has, is important both onshore and offshore for studying these features. Um, and in particular, onshore, we could investigate where these features have been preserved by using the ground penetrating radar. And offshore, of course, more using uh, geophysics and 2D or 3D investigation. And then um, cone penetration testing is extremely important to understand what, where is located the liquefiable layers. So um, in order to investigate liquefaction features and in particular liquefiable layers, it's important to have a very deep understanding of what is the sediment, sedimentary structure that uh, is in place. Um, this is an example of a very um, important and one of the first uh, long-term type of research application of uh, liquefaction, uh, the study of liquefaction features for paleoseismic research. So this is the case of the New Madrid seismic zone uh, in the United States. This was an area that was hit by um, a series of earthquakes between the 1811 and 18. 12 and um, um, the, the liquefaction features in this area, as you can see, were very uh, large in size and also the volume of sand that was ejected at the surface was very high. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, you could see one of the most historical, probably um, uh, scientifically used uh, aerial photos from U the US Army. And you could see how along uh, the meander um, rivers, you could see uh, so many uh, liquefaction and So you could see how uh, this alluvial fatty is, is, is particularly susceptible to uh, the ejection of this type of sediment. So this was um, an historical study case that I often use to explain how um, like the study of liquefaction features for paleoseismic purpose has started and also has been improved because I, I have had the opportunity of actually help one of my PhD supervisors in surveying this area and uh, describing liquefaction features and dating these features. And the study in the New Madrid seismic zone has been carried out from Tattol and her team uh, for the last 30 years. So in 30 years, the records and the dating of liquefaction features that they have been uh, working on was very useful to understand um, the cyclicity of earthquakes in this area. The second case, uh, case study is what actually was the focus majorly of my uh, PhD and um, is the Canterbury earthquake sequence. In this map, you will see um, in two important case studies, um, in particular, the liquefaction caused by the major earthquake of the February 2011 uh, Christchurch earthquake, and then the previous one, the Darfield earthquake, which was the first earthquake of the Canterbury series. You could see how widespread um, was the liquefaction ejection along the Canterbury Bay. And you could see how um, there was a focus uh, and a higher concentration of liquefaction features in the region, in the crisis, right in the city center. This was um, um, quite unexpected, and in particular, it, it wasn't well before this event, before this series of events. 
it wasn't extremely clear how susceptible this area was to this type of process. And you could see these are pictures from the city of Christchurch, from different types of neighborhoods, and how it was um, uh, impacted, um, how the, the everyday life was impacted by uh, the occurrence of all these features. And then the, the government, the city council, had to work out different measures to clean up the city and to rebuild and to uh, clean from all this sand that was ejected. So um, it caused uh, quite a uh, big change into the, also the New Zealand economy, uh, the earthquakes, and then all its causes and health effects. In my case, uh, the study of these liquefaction features was uh, um, boosted by a series of um, different techniques that were used in order to understand what, what, what was the, uh, the reason of um, uh, this susceptibility. So our aim was trying to understand why specific geomorphic setting were uh, so susceptible to liquefaction features. And we had to put together a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-methodology type of work in order to investigate these features. The first step was, of course, a very detailed mapping of all these liquefaction features that, again, were adjacent on meander rivers and uh, on river point bars and in coastal dune settings. So in the alluvial setting and in the uh, coastal dune setting, we have a very high susceptibility of the setting of the, the sedimentology to this, to this uh, type of process. And in this uh, slide, you could see an example of transect that was drawn and of the detailed geomorphic analysis that was uh, done over a specific uh, meander river in a rural area. And our work was to dig trenches along this transect and see the differences between the, the area that liquefied and the area that didn't liquefy. And so the final result put in evidence that where we find liquefaction is um, uh, under point bars because the, sedimenta the sedimentary architecture of these uh, features actually facilitates uh, the traveling upwards of the sediment. And for this reason, we have ejecta particularly concentrated along these features, along the under point bars. And this has been also corroborated by other studies uh, on liquefaction uh, that have been carried around the world. So um, the lesson learned from case studies on shore, uh, not only, of course, from what I've been presenting, but from all the literature that has been available in these 30 years, 35 years, even more probably from the 60s, mid 60s, yes. Um, so yeah, in the last 50s um, of research on sedimentology and uh, liquefaction and with the use of geomorphic um, investigation is that is extremely important to have an approach that can make the best of different techniques and in order to understand why specific settings are so susceptible to these. And this, of course, has important relevance for the, re the resilience of specific urban also, um, environment to this type of process. Monica, and, one minute. Uh, uh, so now, Monica, um, one minute, please. One oh, minute. okay. Already one minute. Okay. Uh -uh. So I need to um, explain why um, uh, liquefaction related to seismic loading um, is then in part is, is has been a particularly. Um, investigated and uh, when um, liquefiable segment meets specific conditions of uh, slope conditions also and the slope gradient, we also have ground failure. And ground failure is what actually causes even more damage to infrastructure, thinking to dwellings or thinking to bridges. And uh, so this is actually what um, of course, during the spreading. So it is a type of um, uh, mass movement that occurs when we have liquefiable sediments. If this has been particularly studied onshore, offshore we have, and these are some examples of spreading onshore, 
uh, and you will, we will see these long fractures that occur along a specific area of the meanders. Offshore, this, is, this hasn't been focused enough. And so this is actually my current work at the moment, always within the theme of understanding the paleoseismology and using different types of approaches um, according to the different setting and geomorphic scale that we need to uh, work on. And um, so what occurs into the uh, subaqueous uh, setting is that uh, specific uh, landslides with specific mass movements will have uh, these um, spreading type of morphologies that is characterized by horse and graben, so by topographic highs and topographic lows. And what is interesting that despite the um, subaqueous spread has been particularly known for being caused by um, the sudden loss of shear strength caused by clay sediment. Um, in very large landslides like Tuangini landslides, offshore New Zealand, or in other um, a few other um, case studies, this um, um, this process has been also caused by the liquefaction of sand. And um, my current uh, research is trying to understand how the mechanics of this process develops and why do we have this specific type of uh, geomorphic um, evidence that is possible to observe in the subarctic setting. So um, this is. Um, my uh, uh, my work so far and trying to um, my effort is trying to link what is possible to see onshore with what is possible to see offshore in order to have a more complete uh, paleoseismic analysis and a more detailed uh, type of um, geohazard investigation especially on uh, environment to, to the earthquakes occurrence. And um, yeah, so these are my conclusions, always on uh, merging the two fields, onshore and offshore, for a better understanding of the active landscapes. Will even and um, yeah, these are some preferences in case somebody wants to go through more in details. And I'm acknowledging my uh, current institutions and the past institutions that allowed me to do this work. Thank you, Vivian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis, as Vivian says. Um, I'm a geographer. Uh, and I, um, I want to thank in, in the first place the opportunity to, to show my work uh, that, that I developed in my master dissertation. The, the work is titled Endocast Potential Evaluation. Uh, in the limestone massive, in the small sector of the, the Stramadura limestone massive, center of Portugal, in the car potential, that means the possibility of the occurrence uh, of uh, underground uh, cast forms, uh, like uh, caves. So the team, this this uh, this work, it's about. Uh, the way understand the way that factors like lithology, geologic structure, topography, oil and cover uh, uh, condition the occurrence of cast caves in the carbonate massive. These factors were combined in order to evaluate the endocast pot potential, as we call it. Uh, in the, uh, the north sector of Santo Antonio Plato. So the main objectives are identify, analyze, and consider the conditional factors of underground classification that affect Jurassic carbonate units and evaluate the endocast potential at local scale uh, and pro producing a cartographic model based or multi-criteria analysis in the GIS environment. And at last, in here on the predictive capacity of the cartographic model produced by comparing the results with a well-known and inventor cave entrance. So about the methodology. In the first step, we select 
the study area and the scale of analysis. We collect the data uh, about condition factors and the inventor uh, cavities. And we storage all the data and processing in the GIS environment. In the second uh, step, we uh, sub subdivide the study area in training and testing areas and uh, choice the multi criteria analysis method, who permit us uh, define the date of variables or factors and respective classes using statistical method. So this way, these weights are uh, applied with uh, uh, the special autocorrelation between factors. For example, uh, the relationship between uh, the carbonate beds and the density factor density. Uh, in next step, <coughs> we over, uh, overlapping all the, the factors and we follow it for the model uh, construction. This uh, this model, sorry, this model uh, was evaluated uh, using the uh, the cave enters, and uh, in that point we uh, followed the iterative process uh, until we uh, get high success rate to accept the model. The model. In this iterative process, we can change the weight of variables, uh, some aspects uh, about the uh, castification factors, uh, whatever. So, some aspects about uh, the castification uh, factors uh, about the theory. Lithology and lithostrophography. Uh, on the carbonate rocks, we consider uh, the more rock purity, the more susceptible to the calcification the, the rocks are. For instance, limestone uh, are more susceptible of calcification than dolstones or dolomite azuris. The type of constituents, such as the presence of insoluble ones like clay minerals, that decrease the susceptibility of calcification. But the, the presence of quartz grains can increase the porosity and the circulation of water inside the rock and increase the susceptibility of calcification. The grain size, depending on the type of fossil, uh, is also important. For example, mitic and matrix supported textures are more susceptible of calcification than disparity and grain supported ones. Another characteristics of carbonate successions, homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Uh, there is a greater susceptibility of calcification in carbonate uh, succession with relative homogeneous beds. Uh, the geometry is also important. Uh, horizontal or sub horizontal beds result in a slower circulation of water in deep, thus providing a high rate of dissolution. About another uh, classification factor, the fractals. We evaluate this factor by density of fault join and or sample alignments or fractal traces and the presence of intersection zones between them. <clears throat> the presence of factors indicate areas with great capacity of deep water infiltration. More water, infil more water infiltration in the carbonate mass, more, more dissolution of the carbonates. The topography we have evaluated with, with this indica indicator, relief energy, as a force of classification. This energy is proportional to automatic difference, max, and the meaning of a given area. At last, land cover use uh, some uh, categories uh, existence in the official cartography. The existence of a dirty tower, uh, like silly classics, silly classics, 
soil and vegetation cover causes a delay in the filtration and subsurface percolation, and also making meteoric waters more aggressive. About the study area is a central portable, the Extremadura limestone massive, that is a, a limestone massive uh, with a extensive antique outcorp of Jurassic carbonate units located uh, in the geologic terms in the so called Luditan Basin. Uh, as you see in the map, the, the study area is represented by the red. Rectangle. Uh, this is an area with about 54 square kilometers in the northern sector of San Antonio Plateau. In this area, exists a profusion of subsurface and underground karst forms, such as currents, current fields, dolines, uvalas, poles, stephead valleys, rock shelters, and caves. I, uh, I show you now some photos in the top left of Vasa's Depression and seen poles. Uh, in the bottom left, the Miramind poles floated in the water several years ago. And the right, uh, top right, uh, the Greater Step Valley, which is located in the study area. You also have some uh, great, uh, larger uh, fields of current fish on the top, le top left and on the bottom left, we have a cave with spring that is located in the Stephead Valley. And on the right, we have uh, the Formout Caves that is one uh, of other caves in the area. So the evaluation of the endocast potential uh, starts with the final, the, the, the definition of the factors. The factors uh, chosen is there are four, uh, starting with lithostratigraph units. Uh, we thought that the same units we, we can, we see in the official geologic cartography. Since we have uh, a lot of geologic information about these units, we made this a, a, a detailed, uh, a more detailed uh, analysis about these units. So we uh, define the uh, indicator susceptibility of classification uh, in the, the four aspects lithology. The characteristics of facets, granulity, texture, quality, porosity, stratonomy, and bed geometry. Uh, as you can see, we scored all these aspects at zero to one, and in the end, we sum the results uh, to define the susceptibility classification, and we have, uh, have a quality assessment from very low to very high susceptibility. The fractal density is, is calculated by the light density tool in the ArcGIS. And we, we define categories using natural janks and we define quality uh, classes. And also relief energy, altimetry difference in meters in the grid, uh, square grid with uh, 100 meters in this, uh, to make this, this calculation, you use blocks, the two block statistics of RPIS. And we also um, define uh, quality displacements. On the land cover, we uh, use the categories that are defined in the uh, official land cover cartography. So there, there are the, the cartographic representation of the four factors. From the left to the right, the left, uh, the first map is the susceptibility to cartography of uh, lithostratigraphic graphic units. In the second, the uh, fractal density. Uh, the lighter colors is uh, less density and the darker is more, more density of fractals. I have to tell in this map, we 
with the raster calculator to to give more importance to the major faults and the factors than uh, the alignments. The third map is about the energy of relief. Uh, the winds are the less uh, energy relief, and the the, the red is more uh, re, uh, relief energy. At least uh, the land cover categories as the official cartography. So to the construction of the model, the cartographic model, use the statistical technique called uh, analytic hierarchy process, uh, we, we, which is based in the pairwise comparison between factors. Uh, the, the importance on one factor is uh, from over another factor. So, uh, this exercise uh, we represented is represented by a square matrix where quantitative values uh, are defined uh, in the scale who goes by, uh, we start with one that, that is um, equal importance between factors and two nine uh, two nine that is extreme importance. Uh, in the end, we calculate the normalized rate value for each factor who represent the importance for the classification, the endocastification of that factor. So, as an example, uh, I show you the, the, the pairwise comparison for the classification factors. As you can see, the lithostrophic units have uh, almost 50% of importance in second fractal density, relief energy, and in the residual value land cover. I have to tell you too that this exercise are made, are, uh, was made for the classes of the factors and the factors. So we achieved this formula that is the sum. Uh, of uh, the multiplication between the eight values of the classes, the factor classes, and the, fa the factors, the eight values of the factors itself. Using the raster calculator and the RGIS achievement, this map, which is the uh, endo represents the endocast potential. One that minute. Map, yes, thank you. Uh, that map uh, uh, in the winds, we, we have very low endocast potential, and the right, we have more, sorry, I, I, very high endocast potential. And we also have the event overlapping the inventory cavities, as you can see, the, the main great number of inventor cavities are located in the height and very high endocast potential classes. To validate or evaluate this model, we use rocky curves, like this one in, in the graphic. Um, in the x-axis, we have endocast potential, and in each one axis, we have the inventor cavities. Uh, about uh, okay. the, the, the major cavities are explained by uh, the height and very high classes of endocast potential. This visual uh, aspect can be translated by the number of, or the value of, of the area under the curve, 82.5%. Uh, the, the location of inventor cavities are explained by the model. That is a very good result. So we can the, discuss the results with another ways, like uh, the graph on the left. We can see almost 80% of the inventor cavities are located in the height and very height uh, and, uh, endocast potential classes. And on the right, the interesting, interesting map uh, graph 
that uh, show us the inventory cavities are located mainly in the middle Jurassic carbonate units. We also uh, made a comparison between our results and the results made in, made in the study in 1995, where the author uh, made a cartography with the uh, evaluation of geologic formations uh, by uh, the castification. Overlapping the, uh, the two results, we generally can uh, say that, it, that it's a, uh, there, are a, uh, there is a match between uh, the two cartographies. Only in very low and low endocast potential classes, we have some significant difference because the, the cartography uh, the cartography is, uh, is also different. In conclusion, the endocard potential of a carbonate mass depends on several condition factors that frequently are dependent of each other. In the study area, there are factors that in this underground calcification. Uh, like relative poorer fine texture of carbon rocks in thicker and less deep beds. In more heterogeneous and carbonate successions with soluble and more insoluble strata, areas with high, higher fractal density, areas with great failure of energy, or existence of dirty tall cover, soil and vegetation associated with forest and agriculture. The area un under the curve values are greater, uh, greater than 80% demonstrate a very good parity capacity of the model, correlation the results uh, with the well-known cave entrance. The evaluation model of the study area made it clear that it's quite different of the quality and or quantity of the information, namely the knowledge of endocast. The cartographic model of endocast potential can be better through the incorporation of more geological data in each cartographic representation, the collection of geomorphologic information in the field, and the refinement of the aids in the analytic hierarchy, hierarchy process. The use of the model in the larger areas of the Stenodura massive, or even in other limestone massive, is essential for its legitimacy in the prep perspective of generalizing its application. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you for uh, your attention. That's it. So good morning, everyone. My name is Amelia. I came from the University of Seville. I'm also a research associate at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. So my presentation is about um, the coastal uh, morphological or geomorphological changes produced by uh, high energy stones. So the summary of my presentation, I'll give you a, bit, a little bit of background on how we monitor coastal systems and particularly focusing on the storm events. I'll present the study site, which is five finger strand. Um, this site is located in Northern Ireland. So we are moving from the Mediterranean context to the Atlantic. Um, also, I will present the monitoring approach that we have followed here uh, to understand uh, these impacts uh, produced by, by the storms. And I'll present uh, the results uh, focusing in two particular storms, a storm Ophelia and a storm Hector. Finally, I will um, give you some conclusions of the, the, the whole study. So the coastal areas, as everyone knows um, already, is a, are a very dynamic and complex environments where changes uh, occur at different temporal and spatial scales. This inherent dynamics of the, of the coast requires the use of multiple environmental data sets that need to be um, uh, uh, acquired at uh, different time scales in order to monitor daily to weekly geomorpholo geomorphological changes. This is not only difficult, but also very expensive because it normally involves uh, large survey teams that need to use multiple instruments, instrumentation for the regular or normal uh, classic GPS to more sophisticated terrestrial laser scanner, which is uh, the TLS that you can see here, which is this equipment, or the um, 
uh, the, the drones. This uh, monitoring uh, approach for coast and environments is also very challenging as it's very difficult or hard not only to pick up event-driven uh, changes, but also to the long-term, uh, to be ordered to monitor long-term uh, changes. Most of the time, we ended up to only capturing net changes that occur from time to time where these surveys are, are, are taken, are, 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 are uh, carried out, sorry. However, uh, the recent advent of low-cost drone systems, and particularly the use of the time-last camera, cameras has uh, facilitated the rapid acquisition of data sets. So here we also want to answer this question is um, the combination of different methods, the classic ones and the GPS, and the most sophisticated with the TLS and the cameras, is the right or a good approach to really capture and understand uh, the impact of storm events. So moving to the study site, this is um, the, sun, uh, this, uh, the, the, the study site, sorry, is Five Fingers Strand, which is located in the northwest coast of Ireland. You can see here in this red square. It's a sandy beach of around two meters uh, long and 350 meters wide. Uh, the system is backed by an extensive uh, vegetating dune, which can reach in, at some points, particularly on the north, uh, um, heights of about 25 meters. The dune toe base or the dune toe, um, uh, the dune base or the dune toe height uh, changes from 2.5 meters in the southern locations to around on average 3.5 meters in the north. This uh, uh, study site is a very special one because it's part of a long-term monitoring program uh, developed by the Ulster University for the past 18 years. So we have plenty of data on a regular basis. So the objective of the work I present here is to understand the geomorphological changes that are produced or induced by two separate storms, the storm Ophelia and a storm Hector, by using multiple equipment for the acquisition of topographic uh, data. So where to study storms? Well, uh, there are many, many reasons, but particularly Ireland is uh, regularly affected by these uh, extratropical remands of Atlantic hurricanes, some of them very famous, and you particularly heard about uh, Hurricane Davy in the 60s or Hurricane Charlie in the 80s. And although the Irish coast is attuned or used to these high energy conditions, infrequent um, storm events can really produce dramatic shoreline responses. These responses are very difficult to predict and they are also very difficult to monitor. We focus here in two uh, storms, or storm of failure that you can see here hitting uh, the, the, uh, the coast of Ireland. Um, Ophelia uh, hit the coast of Ireland in October 2017. And also we are going to focus on storm Hector, a different uh, storm that reached the coast of Ireland in June 2018. So uh, the monitoring approach we follow, uh, it's um, um, uh, half a different part. First of all, regular GPS survey has been carried out in the place since uh, 2014 as part of this long-term monitoring approach with the aim to really uh, understand not only cross-shore, but also alongshore uh, changes uh, within uh, the coast. Particularly for this study, uh, the unknown shore variation of the dune base, of the dune toe height, was assessed uh, in order to really understand that the, the storm uh, that hit the coast were able or have the potential to produce dune trimming or dune erosion. As you can see here, this uh, figure shows the the alongshore section of the dune toe for uh, previous uh, to the to the two storm storm of Pelia in red and storm Hector in in black, and we can see that the dune toe uh, it's not only uh, or changes not only alongshore with the maximum uh, dune toe height reaching on the north path compared to the south, but also it's uh, different from one uh, storm or one uh, situation uh, to the other previous uh, Ophelia, previous uh, Hector. Also, as part of, the, of this monitoring approach, uh, different TLS surveys were carried out uh, before and after each of the storms with uh, using uh, the terrestrial laser scanner with the, the TLS. Here you can see the um, 
the TLS survey that was carried out for, for the different uh, periods with the different uh, scanner positions with the aim of build up a, a 3D a model of uh, the, the topo bathymetry uh, of, the, of the site. So we ended up having um, four models, one a previous uh, a storm Ophelia, one after storm Ophelia, one previous storm Hector, and one after storm Hector. Uh, just in a general view, one can see that the, the, the top of a symmetry is uh, very different from one previous, uh, from one uh, situation to, to, the, to the other. The, the aim of building this uh, model was also to understand the topographic changes to compare using uh, the demo differences of the DOD uh, for uh, uh, both um, situations, previous and post storm. So finally, as, as part of this monitoring approach, uh, we installed in 2016 a time last camera. This time last camera was fixed or is already fixed on a, an oblique view of the beach, as you can see here. And the view captured by the camera extended from the eroding frontal dunes all down to the dune toe, the upper beach, and also um, extended to the intertidal area. Since the camera was set, uh, was set to acquire images every 30 minutes, we ended up with having a lot of high frequency images of the, of the, of the site, resulting in almost uh, 7,000 images annually. Um, I'm trying to see if you can see, this is a, 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 a day of, uh, this is a sample of uh, the image captured by the time-lapse camera over a day. So the camera in this study was uh, used or really helped to qualitatively address real-time wave run up uh, during the, the storm events and also to assess the dune toe erosion. So moving uh, towards the results, here we can see the, the spatial and temporal evolution of the significant wave height during both Storm Ophelia on the upper panel and Storm Hector. Uh, just to recall you that Storm Ophelia, um, uh, the remains of the hurricane, because Ophelia was a hurricane, uh, reached an uh, island on the 16th of October, and it was reclassified as a post-tropical cyclone when it hit uh, the, the, the coast of Ireland. Whereas a storm actor uh, occurred in the second half of June in 2018, and it was formed uh, by an unusually uh, strong jet stream. Both storms were uh, similar in terms of wind speed, but the wind direction over the site was uh, slightly different. Whereas Ophelia was short parallel, Hector was direct uh, onshore. Also, the maximum uh, wave height that the, the storm had uh, over the site was uh, ar uh, around two meters for Ophelia and almost four meters for Hector. Also, a very important variable here was the time the, these high energy conditions um, lasted over the, the, the site. Ophelia barely lasts 12 hours, so it, it did not coincide with high tides, whereas Hector, it lasted for 21 hours. So as we can see here, Ophelia mostly um, uh, lost uh, or gradually dissipated as it traveled north from the south, whereas for during a storm Hector, the energy conditions reached their maximum level on northern Irish latitudes, and particularly over the side, which is five fingers turn, which is um, here. So looking at the at the um, at the wave time series here of the of the storms and the total water levels and the time uh, the tidal records, we found out that the uh, in between the the both surveys, three other storms uh, hit the coast of Ireland before Ophelia uh, did it. This uh, from these uh, three storms, two of them, S1 and S2, had the potential to produce dune uh, trimming or dune erosion, given that the total water levels reached uh, during this storm were above the mean dune toe, which is here marked as this uh, orange um, uh, line. Uh, this was later uh, confirmed by the time last camera, in which we can clearly see how the the the, the bend. Uh, produce some dune erosion over the dune toe, particularly in the southern part, during S1 and S2. Uh, however, when we look at the record, uh, uh, the images uh, captured by the camera during Ophelia, we found out that Ophelia 
which co was coincident with a low tide, and therefore the total water levels uh, produced were less than two meters, actually was about 1.4 meters, and hence uh, that was below the average height of the dune toe. Therefore, Ophelia did not cause any erosion, any, any shoreline retreat in Five Fingers Strand. It seems that the fast tracking speed of Storm Ophelia meant that the sustained high energy wave conditions were very limited, uh, were, they were sorry, very limited at the site. Moving to a storm Hector, which uh, 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 took place in spring 2018, when we look at the, at the wave record, again, we found out that in between the both um, uh, surveys, two other storms hit the place, S1 and S2 here. Both of them uh, uh, have a duration greater than 12 hours, so they, were, they had the potential to coincide with, uh, uh, with high tide, and also they were both of them on surf. However, when we look at the tidal records, and particularly we calculate the total water levels produced by these two events, we found out that, that S1, the first storm, uh, the peak was coincident with high tide, and although the total water levels reached, that was 2.30, uh, were slightly below the average Donto uh, height for the north, ex the north sector, it really impacted the southern part uh, in which the dune toe was below uh, two meters. However, for S2, uh, although it lasted for 57 hours, so it had the, the, the potential to really coincide with high tide, it was coincident with nip tides, and therefore any, any erosion um, did not effectively reach the dune base, as we can confirm here uh, with the time last. Moving to Hector, it was expected to be, to be a very uh, high energy storm. It actually uh, impacted a, a five fingers a strand for many reasons, because it lasted 21 hours and the peak of the storm was coincident with the spring tide. Therefore, the total water levels were far uh, greater than the minimum junto high for most of the beach. And as we can see here in the time last camera, the storm uh, surge really surpassed the average dune to height for most of the beach. So moving to the geomorphological impact, here uh, we, we have the topographic variation pre and post storm Ophelia and pre and post storm Hector. And this is um, calculated using the depth of difference from the T different TLS surveys. And in general, we can see that the, the response, the, the pattern of the response is somehow very different for uh, the, uh, the, the case of Ophelia and the case of Hector. In Ophelia, most of the deposition uh, occur around the intertidal channel where the erosion was concentrating in the upper beach area and also so on the lower beach area. If we look at the dunes, we saw some of dune erosion lost of topographic variation over uh, half a meter by dune trimming, particularly in the south part, when this stone preview of, of Ophelia really uh, had the potential to produce uh, dune uh, erosion. Moving to Hector, the city yeah, one minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm Thank saying. you. Okay. And um, moving to Hector, we see that the pattern of the response was uh, somehow uh, very different. Mostly the deposition occurred in the lower beach and it was concentrated along the north part of the beach, whereas the erosion was mostly on the upper beach and on the southern part of the, of the, of the study site. If we look at the dune toe here on the dune face, we can see a pattern with a red indicating erosion on the upper part of the dune and blues indicating deposition on the down or the below part of the dune. This is uh, suggesting that it's a sediment slapping to the base of the dune from the upper part. This can be explained because of the total water levels reached by the, the F storm actor and also the previous storm were above uh, um, the dune toe high and therefore have the potential to really uh, cause some erosion on the dune base. So uh, to conclude, we can say that this um, a high frequency monitoring over sufficient time periods and also at adequate uh, time scales before, during and after a storm is essential uh, to fully understand coastal response uh, to a storm activity. 
Also, the combination of methods explained here at different spatial and temporal scale allows a better and more accurate understanding of the system and has the capability of really capture certain uh, changes. With this study, we identify several key forcing parameters that are uh, very important in understanding storm response or storm impact, sorry, which, is, which are storm duration and orientation, the tracking speed of the event, the local wave height and tidal water levels. Moreover, the antecedent tidal beach configuration and the pre-storm clustering play important roles in coastal response and can infer distinctive longshore variations. And finally, the synchronicity of variable seems to be crucial for geomorphological storm impact effectiveness. Here we prove that as I expected smaller events that it was a storm actor really proved to be more effective at causing morphological change at it had a better synchronicity, synchronicity of variables and forcing factors than a store of failure did. So thank you very much for your attention. I also want to extend uh, my gratitude to Ulster University and to Professor Derek Jackson for supporting their research and for providing the fieldwork equipment for developing. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you Good morning, uh, to everyone. Uh, can you hear me, really? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is Manuel Jena. Currently, I am a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the University of Bologna in Italy. But in this presentation, I will show you some uh, of the results uh, that I obtained uh, in my PhD done at the, the University of Lleida. Um, see, the title of my presentation is Inferring Geomorphic Processes and Sediment Budget in Badlands Areas by Means of uh, Repeat High Resolution Topography. Uh, in terms of the rationale of our research, uh, as we know, the application of high resolution topography uh, to geomorphologic environments allows to obtain data sets with uh, high spatial resolution and large uh, spatial coverage. Uh, this allows a uh, better uh, characterization of uh, landforms and a reduction of time cost relation, favoring uh, multi temporal surveying. Uh, in turn, uh, this uh, multi temporal surveying uh, helps to have a better understanding of uh, geomorphic processes and uh, dynamics, uh, which helps to improve the landscape evolution modeling and the environmental uh, management practices. And in this context, uh, the main objective of our research was to infer into the geomorphic processes and also in the sediment budget in badlands areas by the use of high resolution topography and relate this with the main uh, meteorological drivers. A study area is a badlands uh, landscape uh, located in the southern Pyrenees and is composed by uh, two experimental micro catchment uh, with an approximate surface of around uh, uh, 0 0.5 hectares, uh, hectares sorry, per, uh, each one of the micro catchment. Uh, both uh, micro catchment are developed on uh, using uh, gray shells and in a humid uh, climate with a total annual, uh, annual precipitation of around uh, 800 millimeters and are uh, located in an altitude of around uh, 600 meters uh, above the sea level. In this way, uh, potentially meteorological drivers will be the same in both badlands. From the morphometric point of view, these badlands present uh, contrasted uh, characteristics, for example, like uh, different drainage uh, patterns and uh, different slope uh, degrees. And in this way, the potential processes that take uh, place will be influenced by the different characteristics of morphometry uh, between these two uh, study badlands. Um, data collection uh, was done by the meteorological characterization and topographic uh, surveys. Meteorological data was uh, collected in a station composed by uh, rainfall and air temperature sensors with a uh, five minute interval registers. On the other hand, uh, we carried out uh, um, 17 topographic surveys during the five years of study period at different temporal scales, including annually and seasonally surveys. We combined the use of terrestrial, uh, terrestrial uh, laser scanner and structure from motion photogrammetry uh, using different platforms in order to analyze the, um, 
the role of these techniques on accuracy and precision of the data sets produced. In this way, we range from one meter to around uh, 150 meters of altitude from ground uh, to auto zero platforms. That is a kind of uh, light uh, helicopter. Uh, after several tests, uh, our results uh, prove that uh, the most suitable uh, method for our study case and for our objectives was the use of a uh, structure from motion technique uh, using a more uh, pole uh, mounted camera. So a camera mounted in a, in a kind of telescopic uh, pole, inspection pole. So uh, point clouds obtained uh, per each uh, topographic uh, survey were filtered and cleaned uh, out from different techniques uh, in order to remove all points that do not uh, represent the bare soil. Uh, here the upper figures uh, show some steps applied for the, the removal of the vegetation for, from this uh, point clouds. I will not enter to, to more detail, but um, mainly the, 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 the point clouds were uh, filtered, uh, removing this, this type of, of noise. Um, after that, uh, point clouds were regularized and decimated in order to obtain the different digital elevation models. And um, we obtained these CDMs for each one of the, the time surveys with a spatial resolution of uh, five centimeters per each pixel. To do this um, decimation and uh, regularization, regularization, sorry, we applied the, the top cut algorithm. So uh, in order to estimate the main topographic uh, changes succeeded between the, the surveys, um, we applied uh, the geomorphic change detection approach, calculating the difference between the new and the old survey dataset in order to obtain the gradation and degradation main processes. Uh, in this uh, DM, uh, sorry, in this uh, DEMS of difference map, so the DOD, a gradation is represented in blue, while uh, the degradation is represented in red. In order to differentiate the real changes from error, uh, we applied an uncertainty uh, assessment uh, based uh, on the fuzzy inference system models. In this way, uh, we calculate uh, the distributed uh, uncertainty maps for each one of the, the study datasets based on the geomorphic characteristics, and then we propagated uh, this uncertainty uh, to the DOD. Consequently, we obtained finally the threshold of DOD, which represents uh, the changes about the value of the propagated error. So we can represent topographic changes in a balanced area with a high resolution and with a high levels of precision and accuracy. But uh, can we infer on the main geomorphic processes based on the landform signatures? In order to uh, answer this, this question, we developed a methodological approach, which uh, was published as a methodological paper in the Air Surface Processes and Landforms during the 2020. Here I will uh, briefly present you some of the highlights of, of this work. Uh, this methodological approach starts from the definition of the main geomorphic processes observed in the field, together with the main processes uh, of this type uh, observed in balance uh, described in, in the literature. Here, for example, I show you four examples where we can see the mass wasting, uh, the reeling galling, sheet washing, and regolith question loss processes. From each one of the, the, the described uh, geomorphic processes, uh, we analyze the main uh, geomorphic signature in terms of uh, geomorphic change, roughness, the slope, and concentrated runoff index. And from the different thresholds and combinations of these inputs, the algorithm was uh, calibrated and parameterized. Then, by the application of a multiband raster, um, uh, sorry, but by a multiband raster classification, we obtained uh, the output map of the signatures of the geomorphic processes. Uh, here uh, we can see some outputs of the algorithm obtained from uh, one of the study micro catchments. Each color is representing one of the main geomorphic processes signatures. Uh, for example, red is representing the mass wasting, purple uh, reeling and galling, blue cutting and filling, yellow sheet, uh, uh, sheet washing and green represent the regolith question loss. Um, briefly, in terms of the spatial distribution of the processes, um, mass wasting is the main geomorphic processes signature observed and is mainly located uh, 
on the north slopes uh, with high slope uh, degree, as we can see here in the map, in the center map. In turn, uh, sheep washing is located uh, on the more exposed uh, flat surfaces, as we can see in figure uh, B, while reeling and galling uh, and cutting and filling are located in the water flow concentration areas. Uh, reeling and galling in the more uh, steep areas, for example, in, in figure uh, A, here in, in purple. And, um, and cutting and filling uh, in the more flat areas of the main drainage network channels. For example, uh, uh, here and uh, in blue, sorry, in a few of C, C, C and, uh, and D. Then uh, the algorithm developed in the previous methodological paper was also applied to the entire five year data set in order to estimate the magnitude of the different geomorphic processes and its relation with the meteorological and morphometric variables at different temporal scales. So not only map these processes, but also try to quantificate and go a step further and relate these with the main drivers. So these uh, results were published as research paper in the Earth Surface Process and Landform also during the, the 2020. Uh, here I will show you also some, some summary of the, of the, the main results obtained. Um, results show mainly how topographic changes are highly located, uh, locally located, uh, concentrated, sorry, and are mainly located on the main channels and the high slopes areas. In terms of the magnitude of changes, uh, average depth of change uh, in lowering, both in lowering and raising areas, was around uh, 10 centimeters of, uh, of depth. Uh, here in this slide, uh, we can see some outputs of the algorithm, which was applied to, to balance two or different study periods. Uh, figures uh, one and three show some examples of cutting and filling signatures in the main channel, together with uh, mass washing and rolling and galling on the slopes. In turn, uh, figure uh, two shows some mass washing deposits on the foot uh, of the hill slope here in, in, the, in the left of the hill shade. And the example is in, on the top of the figure two. Um, while uh, we can see also some examples of the, the, the zone of erosion and the position of one small landslide here in the, in the right of the hill shade. And we can see the correlation or the, the, the example of the, the, the photography here on the right. So we can see the, the correlation between the, the, the estimated or the, 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 quantific, the, the mapping of these processes and the, the correlation with the, the reality. In terms of the volumetric quantification of uh, these processes, uh, this slide uh, shows uh, the geomorphic processes signatures, both uh, for, for both badlands, sorry, volumes are split in raising and lowering, uh, upper and the lower bars respectively of, the, of each one of the, the graphs, and are represented per each one of the study periods at annual and seasonal time scales. And annual will be the, the left part of the graph and uh, the seasonal scale will be the, the right part of the, of the graph. Um, mainly in the case of balance one, it's possible to see that the cutting and filling here presented in green is the main process signature in terms of the lowering, while the mass washing here in, uh, in red is in terms of raising. In the case of balance two, it's uh, a bit different because in both cases, uh, both in gradation and degradation, the mass washing uh, is the main process signature in both, in both directions. So these results potentially indicates that the different morphometry of both badlands is uh, playing a key role uh, on the type of geomorphic processes and associated topographical changes. In terms of the correlation with the meteorological variables, uh, surface flow processes uh, of badland uh, one correlate with the rainfall-based uh, variables, more specifically with the maximum rainfall intensity. And on the other hand, uh, mass washing processes observed mainly in the balance two correlate with the low temperature variables and more specifically uh, with days with temperature below zero degrees. Uh, the main conclusions uh, 
of uh, this research can be summarized as the, the use of the high resolution topography allows to survey a low level of change detection, which permits to quantify small magnitude processes, and at the same time, uh, improve substantially the time involved in data collection and the spatial coverage of this technique. In this way, the use of the high resolution topography in geomorphologic environments allows to obtain the very accurate landform properties and morphometric variables, and this, together with the geomorphic change, can help to estimate the signatures of the main geomorphic processes. From this basis, uh, the presented algorithm here in, this, uh, in our research, uh, in this case, uh, apply it to infer the, the signature of the geomorphic process imbalance can be also parameterized, parameterized sorry, and calibrated to be applied in any other different geomorphic environment. In terms of the specific uh, results observed in the study balance, the main conclusions are that uh, the processes responsible uh, of the main geomorphic change observed highly depends on the morphometric characteristics. And then also that the rainfall variables control surface uh, flow processes, while the low temperature variables control mass wasting based processes. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much for all your attention. Uh, I'm, I think that I went too fast, so I think that we have plenty of time to, for the questions, and I will be very happy to, to answer if there is uh, any doubt. Thank you. So, good morning to everyone. As the title reports, I'm going to present the uh, evolution of the archaeological site of the Greek Roman colony of Tindoris, analyzing the geomorphological context in which the city developed uh, over the time. Before starting, I will thank the University of Turin, the University of Messina, and their spin off, uh, Imageo and Georgi, respectively, that uh, supported me in data collection and elaborations. So, this research uh, has been carried out aiming to investigate what what Pliny the Elder, a famous Roman historian of the first century, uh, tried to hand down to us about a great disaster in this important site of Sicily. In particular, in Naturalis Historia, it, uh, it dedicates an entire chapter to the city uh, taken away by sea storms and waves. Regarding Tinderis, uh, he said that uh, Pontus Absolit, so the sea carried away, Ex insula chati ginta medium passuma brutta, so more than 30,000 of pages were torn off by the insula in the island of Chea. And in uh, Sicilia, in Sicilia, in Sicily, the medium Tindarida urban, which means the half of the city of Tindari. The main goal was to shed light on the occurred phenomena uh, through a historical research and a geomorphological analysis flanked by uh, field service and amended the area vehicle photogrammetry. So the site is in the northern part of Sicily, on the Tyrrhenian coast, in front of the Aeolian island, for whom is not uh, addicted with the southern Italy geography. And uh, its uh, territory is characterized by a huge promontory uh, bounded by a sea cliff on which a sanctuary was built in the Middle Ages. Uh, the area is uh, literally invaded by tourists uh, in uh, summertime uh, due to the natural reserve of the lakes of Marinello and for religious purposes during the whole uh, year. And of course, uh, for the wonderful beaches that characterize the spit, uh, there is a typical landform at the position uh, bar uh, extended in the sea with the salt uh, uh, marsh located uh, in, in, in its rear. It is generated by longshore current and longshore drift and by the same uh, sea waves, uh, which uh, gives origin to the process. So the geological position is peculiar. It is in the zone between the compression caused by the subduction of the Ionian plate under the European plate and the extension of the uh, Tyrrhenian basin. Uh, furthermore, the uh, differential uh, velocity of the subduction process uh, created in northern Sicily a transfer area where the main structure are uh, strikes this fault. One of that is the uh, Tindari Doyani fault. In some other opinions, the responsible also for the uh, uh, volcanism in central uh, Eolian Arc. And of course, the responsible of the complicated tectonic uh, setting in uh, Tindari Promontory. 
the bedrock is uh, metamorphic, referred to alpine Archean origin with marbles and sheets. Uh, the um, series of horse and graben are filled by sandstone and claystone of the four deep deposits. Uh, but the site is in, in a flat area characterized by a raised marine deposit uh, 250 meters above the uh, sea level. The tectonic structure clearly influenced the direction uh, of, the, uh, of rocky coastline. So as for an historic summary team, it was founded in 4th century before Christ as a Greek colony, but soon the presence of the Carthaginian army caught the Roman Empire attention, which is uh, the maximum attention during the 3rd century before Christ. This uh, led to the First Punic War, in which Tindaris led to the first, um, 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 in which Tindaris play an important uh, role, especially for Crete. Uh, between uh, the Crete um, of the Carthaginian and Roman army. Uh, once Roman conquered Sicily, Tindaris was the best scenario for the pursuit of Octavian, Octavian Augustus at the expenses of Pompeians. Uh, in the first century, it was declared as Roman colony. This was an eye distinction in the Roman Empire, indicating that Tindaris was then an important and prosperous town, um, an award given to only five cities in Sicily. But then Strabo in uh, 24 called it a polisma, which is a Greek word that can be uh, translated uh, as a, a town that used to be large, but now is small. So the decline of Tindaris uh, obviously occurred after 21 and 22 before Christ and before the uh, Pliny death uh, in 79, and probably before the 24 as the police modern used uh, by Strabo. Uh, the Tindaris uh, episode is mentioned by Plinius in a chapter dedicated to the city, to the cities uh, which have been absorbed by the sea. Um, but a recent archaeological excavation in the site have revealed earthquake-related damage attributed to an event mentioned by Plagon in 70, to which tsunami deposits have been also referred. Uh, an interesting document ascribed the destruction to uh, the 33 um, to an earthquake uh, occurred in uh, Asia Minor during the crucifixion of Christ, reported by Christ uh, Apostles. So the archaeological site preserved the Decumanus, the main street of Roman city, um, in which archaeological study reports some side effects consisting of preferred orientation of collapsed structure and strong undulating deformation in the roadbed that was probably uh, due to the liquefaction, uh, liquefaction phenomena ascribable to an earthquake post Roman colonization. Um, probably the one of our previous deposits, the most known of the fourth century. The city wall are well preserved. Uh, built with the sandstone of fishoid uh, deposits that are easily accessible in, uh, in the area. It is interesting to know that they are missing at the boundary with, uh, with, uh, with the sea cliff. Um, some uh, archaeologists wrote for no necessity to defend the city in the northern side due to the uh, sea cliff. So we decided to better investigate the geomorphology of the promontory. Uh, performing a uh, unmanned aerial vehicle fly, uh, flights for uh, with the purpose to produce a photogrammetic study uh, and the export of 3D models because not every place of the of the of the cliff of course are reachable. Very high resolution VAMs and orthopodos have been then uh, generated and uh, um, a field survey has been carried out to observe uh, landforms in particular for those related to gravity. So the photogram, the photogram, the photogrammetry consists of uh, five steps. The first is the drone flight, started from the theater uh, of the archaeological site and from the beaches in front of the cliff. Uh, we use two drones with similar cameras regarding the megapixel capacity, but different for lens. Uh, both are DJI models. Uh, we executed then uh, four uh, surveys, two horizontal aim to uh, investigate uh, the topography. Um, and two surveys were, on the contrary, uh, practical to explore and uh, model the cliff and prepare future stability analysis. Biologies of the meta shape, a dense point cloud has been, uh, has been generated uh, with uh, about 1,000 of uh, 
required photos. The result is a massive quantity of, uh, of points obtained. Then, of course, uh, a mesh was generated to define the shape of the soil and to manage a three dimension model by the texture generation that uh, for, for, for making it more, more uh, realistic. So the result is a very high resolution model of the, of the promontory. It's possible to note how the cliff are still visible with uh, an horizontal sight. Uh, I hope that everyone can see the video. It is, uh, is very, very heavy uh, <laughs> dimension. So this is the model generated by the 45 degree angle fight uh, with uh, this precision uh, every geomorphological feature can be observed. You can note every flow channel and their accumulation zone, uh, often truncated uh, in uh, hanging wall, hanging, uh, hanging valley, sorry, by uh, the, the secret uh, uh, scarf. Uh, the set of discontinuities uh, that prefers to, to landlide and also the uh, edge of the plateau uh, that uh, uh, that is characterized by the gravitational uh, crown, um, the, the crown of gravitational phenomena. So a DAM and a DSM in this case, uh, and the host photo has been uh, then exported with uh, 20 centimeters and 5 centimeters resolution, respectively. Uh, once the geomorphological feature of uh, the cliff uh, of the entire area uh, area was uh, was clear was uh, uh, a field the geomorphological survey has been performed in surroundings of the coastline uh, with any by through any necessary means by walking and taking on the rocks by swimming and by boat to reach the most remote beaches so I present you three uh, particular site whose location is uh, visible on the auto photo. Uh, the southernmost site is characterized by a debris flow deposits uh, eroded by the sea waves and uh, in which some archaeological materials were found. The most interesting thing is the presence of several rounded sandstone blocks, probably belonging to the city building material. In fact, the flat surface from which the debris flow came is uh, a terraced marine surface and not a fish showing the one. So toward north, <clears throat> the second site is characterized by rock avalanche uh, deposits uh, with uh, blocks of magic size. Um, the particular things of the, these uh, deposits <clears throat> are the cemented breaches with pottery material inside. The northernmost site is characterized by a huge pocket beach uh, bounded by a, a large landline accumulation zone with uh, archaeological repairs uh, in uh, its uh, little scale. Uh, the most important is a uh, napkin work of pottery, the one, uh, not being dated yet, but uh, ascribed, of course, at uh, the Roman time. Then it was possible to produce a slope map with uh, 20 centimeters, centimeters resolution from the DAM. Uh, and uh, a preliminary geomorphological map. At the moment, it's still not so detailed scale, but uh, shows uh, uh, how the crowns or large land landslide affect the flat surface on which the site is built. Uh, in the cliff, the recent um, gravitational phenomena are that this flow, uh, which uh, uh, developed uh, with uh, their transportation uh, channel. Transportation channel. So the uh, 3D model uh, generated with uh, GIS tools uh, should allow to refine the landforms and uh, georeferencing uh, layer, for example, the uh, archaeological site map. Uh, it is interesting to observe how the missing city walls uh, in uh, dotted uh, brown line um, are in correspondence with the uh, with the crown of the uh, landslide, the general landslide, in this case, rotational. Um, yeah. So uh, there are still open questions. Uh, Tinder is built on a hill at uh, to, uh, 168 meters above sea level. 
so its destruction could be uh, credited to a, a landslide uh, rather than to an earthquake generated uh, sea wave, uh, as uh, probably Pliny obs uh, observed. Uh, however, we cannot exclude the specific context in which uh, Pliny raised the epitope. Um, probably, uh, it could probably uh, happen an uh, earthquake in this land, like because the period is uh, uh, well constrained by, by the, histori the historians. Um, another thing we cannot exclude is that the northern slopes were used by Romans as a landfill for city waste. So all the archaeological material uh, present uh, are referable to this uh, this uh, uh, way uh, of uh, behavior. Uh, in the future, uh, the dating of the archaeological findings were expect, expected to be performed to have time constraint uh, on the landslide event or uh, on uh, the date on which they. Uh, uh, the, the cities and from the, the, the material out of tip. Uh, considering the high frequentation of the beach during the summertime, it is possible uh, with this model to, uh, um, to perform a geomechanic geostructural survey, uh, thanks to the photogrammetic model, uh, which can help to uh, produce a uh, uh, very precise hazard map or an and more precise estimation of uh, volume of the rock fall uh, on the cliff. Uh, so I thank you for uh, your uh, attention.